Virgil wrote supposedly the greatest poem, the greatest work of art in the Roman literature. It was an artistic success. It's the story of Aeneas, who has to spend the first six books of the poem wandering around the Mediterranean, looking for Italy, looking for a place to found Rome. And the books 7 through 12 consist of him fighting various Italian tribes for the right to set up his little happy little village, which will eventually become Rome. Um, it's not, as those of you who did the reading this weekend have found out, it's not exactly the easiest stuff to read. It is nowhere near as much fun to read as Homer's Iliad, or especially the Odyssey, but it's because it's got so much public affairs ladled onto it. Aeneas, the Virgil's Aeneid conveys ethical leadership. Um, Aeneas is the poster boy for ethical leadership, community engagement, cultural competence. Here's the history. It boils down to this. Augustus Caesar was the greatest Roman who ever lived. He really was. He was not a nice guy. But he took a Roman political system, which was nowhere near capable of ruling all of this. I mean, my God, they elected new officials every year. Um, knowing that he could not declare himself to be the king. The Romans had a kind of a bad thing about kings. They kicked all their kings out in 50, after 509 BC. And just a suggestion that a Roman leader wanted to be a king was usually good enough to get him killed. This is exactly what happened to Julius Caesar on the Ides of March, 44 BC. He was ruling the world. He was doing a good job of ruling the Roman world. But he started making noises as if he wanted to be the king, and that got him turned into a human pincushion. His adopted son, Augustus, fought civil war for 13 years, which is up there. Um, the important thing is that Augustus found a solution to the problem of ruling the empire. Basically, he pretended it was still a democracy. But the people who ran for office were all chosen by, guess who? Augustus Caesar. The people who commanded the armies were chosen by Augustus Caesar. The people who handled the money were, can you see where this is getting. But Augustus at the same time marketed himself, branded himself as just a regular guy living in a regular house with his regular wife, Livia, and of course, all the time talking about just how, <laughs> I like that picture, how grand he is. The system was called the Principate. And as with anything, you hear about how great it is all the time, you start to think, no, it's not all that great. My rule of thumb in dealing with people is that if somebody is going to take all sorts of time to tell you how great they are, they're usually not. If Augustus is really all that great, he shouldn't need to tell us how great he is, but he did. Augustus used architecture, Augustus used propaganda, Augustus used statues, he used awards, he used all sorts of techniques to try to get across this idea that Rome is great because the gods love Rome and I'm great because I'm just your peaceful, friendly, um, influential kind of dude who just kind of like saved the country. And one of the things that he did to enhance his brand, his public relations campaign, his propaganda campaign, whatever you want to call it, was the Aeneid of Virgil. Rome's greatest poet was asked as a personal favor by Augustus to write a poem about Aeneas. To the extent that this poem is about Aeneas and his struggles, okay, it is meant to challenge the Iliad and the Odyssey. The Romans had a chip on the sh the sh their shoulders about the ancient Greeks. It has to be more fun than the Odyssey. It has to be more moving than the Iliad. 
Well, it's not, and it's not. It must glorify Rome. It does that. And it is also an allegory for Augustus Caesar himself. It is an allegory how, of how Augustus Caesar had to wade through war and battle in order to reestablish Rome. And I think, too, that this is part of the problem, that, um, you know, for all of these fancy temples, nice-looking statues, religious rituals, you know, his life story posted on the walls of every major town in the ancient Roman world, Latin or in Greek, it's kind of biased towards him. It's got a public affairs mission. We're going to come back to this passage, this particular passage here, Rome's public affairs mission. But I wanted to show you again, this is what we ended with last time, um, this is basically the motto. This is basically the follow your passion, find your place thing of what it means to be an ancient Roman. And they are dead serious about it, and a lot of it is true. You, Roman, govern the nations with your power. Remember this. These will be your arts. To impose the ways of peace, show mercy to the conquered, and subdue the proud. This is basically Rome's mission to the world. This is why Aeneas has to go found Rome. This is why he has to, like I say, emulate the wonderful public affairs mission. Before I get into the new stuff, let me ask if there is any, you have any questions about the framework of the poem. It is great art, it really is. It's incredibly moving, I was reading it with a couple of my students this morning in Latin, and it is, it can touch your heart. But for the most part, I think I know how you felt about reading it this weekend. And I don't blame you. What I would like to do though is suggest the major themes which will be important for our study of catabasis. Number one is, Aeneas was in this relationship with this woman named Dido. I can't stress this enough because Dido, as it turns out, I'm gonna sit down for a second here, is the queen of Carthage. When Aeneas and Dido meet, in book one. Every Roman knows, and now you know too, that this romance is absolutely doomed. Rome and Carthage were destined to fight three knock-down, drag-em-out wars in the second and first centuries BC, no, third century BC and the second century BC. They all ended with Carthage losing and finally the Romans turned Carthage into a parking lot. So the budding romance between the um, future founder of the future city of Rome and the city of, and the queen of Carthage, it's just not going to work. And yet, the sad thing is, you, Virgil writes it so you wish it, it would have. When Aeneas gets off the boat in book one, he lands in Carthage. The guys are all bedraggled, and they're hungry, and they're lost. They don't really know what they're doing. They don't really know where they're going. Their hometown of Troy has just been turned into a parking lot by those dang slimy Greeks coming in there and that stupid horse of theirs and all of that. Um, and they wound up with the, the city. It's a big, beautiful city, a young city, but nice new buildings, people running around, you know, shopping people, you know, trading with each other, people living their lives, and it's run by a queen. A queen by the name of Dido, D-I-D-O. And of course, she wouldn't you know, she's right around Aeneas's age. She's absolutely gorgeous, and she is in every respect his equal, except for one thing. Her city is already founded and it's already working. Aeneas has to go found a city and he doesn't even know where he's going yet. Aeneas 
And I got to say, Virgil does write movingly about this. Um, the goddess Venus, who is Aeneas' mom, smacks um, poor Dido, so she gets even more in love with Aeneas. Aeneas tells her about all of his woes in the sack of Troy in book two, and she's weeping, and by the end she wants to help Aeneas make a little baby Aeneas, and stuff like that. But I mean, Aeneas has completely fallen for her too. And in book three, we've got Aeneas, um, he's like walking around, you know, dressed up like a Persian, and Dido is more than happy to let him be the co-ruler of her new city. And I can't help but think, if it weren't so historically bad, I mean, who wouldn't like to spend their life living with somebody who is attractive and crazy about you and is interested in the same things you're interested in and, you know, um, just get old with somebody you're absolutely nuts about and be a king and a queen together, be royals. That would be pretty awesome, but it's not meant to happen. The god, Hermes, the god Mercury um, comes down in book four and tells Aeneas, hey, look, Aeneas, you better go found Rome. This is where we really see the, where Aeneas is coming from. Just like Gilgamesh was kind of like a booger you know, in the beginning of the Gilgamesh epic, he didn't really know much of anything. Just like Odysseus was kind of a whiner until Penelope kind of slapped him around and showed him who was the smart one in that marriage. Just like poor Everett, he didn't even know the treasure he sought. Aeneas has this dim idea that he's supposed to go off and found this city called Rome or whatever, but for right now, he's in a relationship with this gorgeous, brilliant, accomplished woman who is the queen of this new town, and he gets to be the co-ruler of this town, and you know, he could see this being a long-term relationship until Mercury comes down there and says, Aeneas, hit the road. Aeneas realizes in book four that yes, he does have to hit the road. And it is with sad heart he tries telling Dido, Dido, and it really boils down to this. His whole argument is, Tell me if you've heard this one before. It's not you, it's me. You're a fine lady, what a good wife you would be. Aeneas said, Dido, you're a fine girl, what a good wife you would be. But um, I've got to go found Rome. And he does just that. Aeneas and his men sail off to the country of Italy, the land of Italy, look in the rearview mirror, there is smoke in the rearview mirror, there is fire, there are things burning down. It turns out that Dido has committed suicide and then burned her own palace down on top of herself. Which explains, I guess, the eternal enmity between Rome and Carthage. This also shows the first instance of um, Aeneas providing ethical leadership, providing community engagement. Because he is Aeneas, damn it, the future founder of Rome. He is not meant to be Mr. Queen of Carthage, boy toy friend. And he has to realize this about himself, and he has to do the right thing for the future Rome that he's going to found, and he has to put aside his personal happiness. He has to put the good of the people ahead of his own personal happiness, which is really a peculiarly Roman idea. And then he winds up on the shore of this place called Italy, right at the beginning of book six. Why does Aeneas have to go on catabasis? Well, Odysseus went on catabasis. Gilgamesh went on catabasis. You can't be much of an epic hero at all unless you go on a catabasis yourself. And so we need to pay attention to the details of this catabasis. It's easily the most boring out of the catabasis stories I've assigned you this semester. I apologize. 
but on the one hand, it looks back to Virgil, I'm sorry, to Homer's catabasis, to um, Odysseus's catabasis in the Odyssey. Some of the same depressing details. Um, Cerberus, the dog, the divine judgment of people, Tartarus, um, the 53 top sinners of the ancient Greek afterlife are all down there. But it's given a uniquely public affairsy twist. Number one, if you ever found yourself writing an essay on this, on like a test or something like that, you could say Odysseus just wants to learn how to get home to Penelope, to whom he's been faithful the entire time, or not. And he hears a lot of interesting things from Achilles, you know, his old buddy who tells him how horrible it is to be dead. He hears from his mom, Anticlea, whom he tries to embrace three times, but he can't because she's just his shade. But it's all about getting home. It's all about getting home to Penelope. And there's nothing about the people of Ithaca, nothing about the great Greek cause, nothing about pub cultural competence or any of that. It's just a personal relationship. Whereas Virgil's Aeneid is, has Aeneas going on a catabasis because he has to find out more about his mission and he has to talk to his dad. And the public affairs mission is again implicit throughout the catabasis. We've still got the dead guy. We've got two dead guys. We've got um, two sacrificed men in this guy, Mycenaeus and Elpinor. Um, and it also has overtones of Plato. You'll recall that the clear message from, from Odysseus's catabasis is life is nasty, brutish, and short, and then, my friend, you die. That is to say, um, life, you know, you're going to be a soul forever and ever. This is horrible. The body is good. The soul is bad. Boo hoo 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 hoo. Thanks to Plato. Smart word now has it that the body you're in right now is just a parking place for your immortal soul. That your soul exists forever and ever, and your body is less important. So there's going to be strongly moral overtones in Virgil's underworld that you don't see in Odysseus's underworld. And also, the other thing I want you to see as we cover the catabasis of Aeneas today, and this today is all we're going to have time for, is it looks forward to the ultimate showpiece, showstopper of all catabasis stories in Western civilization, that is Dante's Dang Inferno. You're going to find that in the Aeneid, certain categories of sinners are put in certain places. And you're going to find out that the worst sinners are the ones who commit breaches against public affairs. So with that, I propose to stand up and start talking about the um, actual goings on of Virgil Aeneid 6. I mean... I grant you, this isn't the greatest thing in the world. This is what the Sibyl says. Are you slow to vow and to pray, she cries. Are you slow, Trojan Aeneas? For till then the mighty mouths of the awestruck house will not gape open. So she spoke and was mute. A chill shudder ran through the Teucrian's sturdy frames, and their king pours forth prayers from his inmost heart. No, no, no. Basically... He has a liminal experience when he goes into the temple of the Sibyl. That's S-I-B-Y-L. The Sibyl's um, hangout, and I did remember to bring a marker today, at least, Sibyl, is a place called Avernus. A great place, not Averins, Avernus, ain't that right? Um, a great place to have 
I'm winking at you, I'm nodding at you, I'm nudging you. A liminal experience. Avernus is a place with such miasmic air that it gets its name because there's no birds. No birds can live in the air there. It's a big hole in this wall, this big huge ledge. Um, the Sybil lives there. She's this crazy little old semi-divine lady who makes prophecies that she writes down on post-it notes and then throws them up in the air um, because she's elderly wacko too. Um, once Aeneas buries the, you know, or makes arrangements to bury the sacrificed man, Mycenaeus, and once he talks about the sad tale of Palinurus, the steersman who fell out of the boat, washed up on the shore of Italy, only to get killed by the natives. I mean, it sounds really sad, but you and I know that's just two instances of the sacrificed man. Aeneas is free to take the golden bow and head on to his catabasis with the Sibyl as his guide. He's going to consult with wisdom figures down in the afterlife. He is most interestingly, most importantly, going to talk to his father, Anchises, who has been dead now for about half a book. And the beginning, and I've, I've bold-faced and put in red the most important parts of book six. Um, most of this you don't really even have to know. Up to like, ooh, geez. Line 212, no less. Meanwhile on the beach, the Teucrians were weeping for Mycenaeus. I'll help you out here too. Mycenaeus equals Elpinor equals Enkidu equals George Nelson. Who said that? Somebody said babyface. I'm kidding. Um, a deep cave there was, yawning wide and vast, of jagged rock, and sheltered by dark lake and woodland gloom, over which no flying creatures could safely wing their way. Such a vapor from these black jaws was wafted to the vaulted sky, whence the Greeks spoke of Avernus, the birdless place. They sacrificed four dark-backed heifers, they... Let's just get them on the road. They say hi to Palinurus, who is deceased man number two. Charon, the boatman, gets angry. He said, this guy's alive. I don't like taking live people in my boat. And this is like one of the very few instances of Virgil being making a funny. Um, it says here, Ah, uh, there's just there's Cerberus, the three-headed doggy, and here he meets Dido. Phoenician Dido was wandering around in the great forest, and he speaks with her. He tries to make up with her. He tries to ease her pain. She does not want to touch him. She does not want to see him. And if that doesn't make, if that's not bad enough, she goes back into the shades, and into the arms of her first husband. So it ends with Dido, you know, telling Aeneas to go perform an impossible biological feat on himself. And line 477, he sees that there are two paths that they can go by. He sees his um, big buddy Dephobus, the son of Priam. This is like the interview with Achilles. Remember the two most important people that Odysseus speaks with in the Odyssey are number one, Achilles, who tells him never seek to follow, you know, that being dead sucks no matter how much chaos you rack up. And his mom, 
Anticlea. Okay? Aeneas has already futzed up talking to Dido. He's now going to have a nice long chat with Deiphobus about, you know, the Trojan War. Deiphobus got to marry Helen after um, Paris died. He was Mr. Helen of Troy for about two weeks or something like that. And he got killed and his face is all ripped up to crap and stuff like that. This is obviously a shout out to the discussion with Achilles in the Odyssey. Finally, the Sibyl comes up and says, okay, Aeneas, enough chattering as your guide. It's time for you to go out and see how things really happen. And just as in um, <laughs> Homer's Odyssey, book nine, there is Elysium, which is where all the best and happiest people go. There is Tartarus, where the heavy duty sinners go. And then there's the place where basically you and I, every Jethra, every Bubacus goes, regardless to Homer of how we lead his life, we lead our life. Tartarus has got some really neat description there. We have a um, huge gate, pillars of solid adamant, that no might of man, not even the sons of heaven, could uproad in water. And there is a list of really horrible people too. Salmoneus, who um, aped Jove's, Jove's fires. He aped Jove's fires. Good work. Um, look, there's Ixion. There's the Lapiths. There's Tantalus. We've got the 53 top sinners of the ancient world with a few extra other ones hanging around in Tartarus, which is reserved for especially bad sinners. Next. This is an example of something that I could almost hear Dante saying. And I've highlighted it in blue for some stupid, in order to make it completely illegible. <laughs> Let's try it. I'm black on white. There we go. That's, there, here were they who in lifetime hated their brethren, or smote a sire, and entangled a client in wrong, or brooded in solitude over wealth that they had won, nor set aside a position, portion for their kin. The largest number this, who were slain for adultery, or followed the standard of treason, feared not to break... We're going to find Dante segregating his sinners in the concentric circles of hell, working from the most trifling sins all the way down to the worst. We can see Virgil here making an, a, um, an early assignment. Please notice, too, that these are pretty much public affairs crimes. Now, adultery, yeah. Hating your brethren, yeah. Smiting a sire, that's not public affairs crime. Entangled a client in wrong. Sold his country for gold. Made and unmade laws for a bribe. Slighting the gods. This is what gets you into Tartarus according to... Um, to Virgil, it's not just the typical, you know, raping some, you know, somebody kind of crimes. It's public affairs. They do get to look at the blissful groves and stuff like that. And here we go. Deep in a green veil, Father Anchises was surveying with earnest thought. Remember, Anchises is, is Aeneas' daddy. And he finally gets to, oh, get this, get this. He sees a sequestered grove and rustling forest thickets and the river Lethe drifting past those peaceful, peaceful homes. About it hovered peoples and tribes unnumbered. Another shout out to Plato's myth of her, which bored me. We go on. It's time for Aeneas to talk about, to learn about how life really works. At 
34. This red stuff here does not need to be memorized in its entirety. It just basically states, and Kaisis basically states, that after you die, you are punished for your sins. And you are rewarded for your good deeds. And some souls are hung stretched to the empty winds, from others the stain of guilt is washed away. When time cycle is complete, the inbred taint has been remained, and the people have rolled time's wheel through a thousand years. They then revisit the vault, the vault above and look for another life. Again, a shout out to Plato's myth of Ur, again saying that the soul is more important than the body, and absent, absolutely absent from any of this are the words carpe diem. This is not a poem about how to lead a happy life. Leading a happy life is probably actually a bad thing. After that, we pretty much get a parade of great Roman heroes. And you don't really need to you know, worry too much about this. Come hither now, your two-eyed gaze. That's what it says. Come hither now, your two-eyed gaze. Here is Caesar and all the seed of Eulus destined to pass under heaven's spacious sphere. And the rest, oh God, it's about eight paragraphs of great Romans doing great things. Shout outs to Cato the Elder, to King Numa, um, Romulus, Remus, none of whom will ever be born if Aeneas does not get with the program. And finally, right at the end, there's just a little poignant little thing about Marcellus. Marcellus was the appointed heir of Augustus Caesar who died young. And so he throws in a great young shout out to Marcellus. And I just need to find one more thing. No, that's good enough. And then he gives him the public affairs speech again. Remember rule, remember Roman to rule with power, to impose the will arts of peace to rescue the weak, and to fight the haughty. Aeneas has learned what he needs to learn from his catabasis. The way by which he gets back is rather suspect, though. 893 tells us, two gates of sleep there are, one they say is of horn and offers a ready exit to true shades. The other sheen, shines with a sheen of polished ivory. Delusive dreams come out of it from the world below. Anchises escorts his son and the Sibyl and sends them forth by the ivory gate. Aeneas speeds his way to the ships and rejoins his comrades. Then straight along the shore he sails for Caeta's haven. Two gates one of horn, the gate for true shades. The other shines with a sheen of polished ivory, but delusive dreams upward through it issue from the world below. Anchises escorts his son and within the sibyl and sends them forth by the ivory gate, the gate of deceit, the gate of falsehood. It now becomes a question, and there is no right answer to it. People have been arguing about this ever since, you know, literally for 2,000 years. And over on the other side of campus, they're still arguing about it. <laughs> oh, great fluffy. Um, question is, Virgil, the poet, has just finished a very artistic, very public affairsy 
catabasis for his hero Aeneas. If you read it as an allegory, you can imagine Aeneas, I'm sorry, Augustus going down into the underworld to consult the late Julius Caesar. You get a parade of Roman heroes trotted out. Um, you've got the shout outs to Homer. You've got um, the you know, horrible crimes being punished in Tartarus. It's all by the books. It's all really good. It's so great that Dante, Dante Alighieri, took it at face value. But if you read closely, and I just helped you read this closely, Virgil clearly says that Aeneas did not return through the gate of Horn, which is the true and exit from the underworld. He went by the gate of ivory from which lies come. And people, I notice they're, they've gotten pretty quiet over there now. Um, the question is, is this Virgil's way of saying this is all a bunch of hoo-ha? Is this, Aenea, is this Virgil saying ha-ha-ha-ha-ha? Psych. Is this Virgil saying not at the end? The people, and I don't really care, it doesn't really change my appreciation of the poem at all. It is interesting, I think, for <clears throat> public affairs reasons, is that Virgil himself demonstrates ethical leadership by writing the poem. He shows community engagement by presenting the Augustan party line, the propaganda, the branding efforts, in a way that people still read today. I mean, I have two young women who come to my office at 9.30 every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and we sit and read the Aeneid together in Latin for an hour. And I don't even get paid for doing this. I like it. It's that good of a poem. This is that good of a catabasis story. So yeah, Virgil is, I'm sorry, yeah, Virgil is definitely doing his community engagement. Cultural competence, I will let them speak for themselves. He's got the cultural competence. Oh, you don't have to do that, Madeline. Unless it's really bugging you to death. Ah. Yeah, Rich says shut the door. The boss says shut the door. We've worked together before, Madeline, and I gotta tell you, the guy is an absolute slave driver. There's two ways of doing things. His way and also his way. The other way is also Rich's way. But let's all give him a golf clap of our love and appreciation. I think I'll invite him to the class for the rest of the semester. <laughs> I behave better when he's here. Don't I? <laughs> okay, seriously, is Virgil just throwing it away at the end? Just remember that when Antigone was given the command by Creon that neither she nor anybody else must bury the body of Polynices. Antigone, who is a loyal, citizen of Thebes, who recognizes her special duties as a member of the Theban royal house, says, it would be so easy to go with the flow. And it would be. It would be very easy for Antigone to say, I'm going to wait for Creon to die, then Hymon and I will be king and queen. I didn't give birth to him. He didn't beget me. We'll make a wonderful couple. But she did the tough thing, did the right thing, because it was what she believed. Virgil is writing this brilliant poem about Aeneas, which is also an allegory for Augustus Caesar, his own bad self. Unlike Creon, who didn't want to be king, Augustus wants to be the prince, and he's good at it, and he is a good leader. But do you think... This might be Virgil's way of saying, his little under the table way of saying, I'm not drinking the Kool-Aid here.
speaking for myself as somebody who lampoons the public affairs mission frequently, hilariously, but also believes it's important at the same time, I tend to sympathize with the idea that the end of this catabasis is indeed Virgil finding his own way, finding his own ability to live with himself after having written this great, big, huge, honking piece of propaganda. His way of saying, before I was a tool, I was a poet. Maybe I'm being overly harsh, but at any rate, that's what I have for you today. Not done yet. I need to pause and ask if there are any questions from the floor about Virgil, his wonderful Aeneid, Aeneas, or anything. Yeah, go ahead. Is that the same thing as the That would be nice if it was. What is your name again? John. Okay, this is my point, John. And for the record, my middle name is John. My, grand, my mother's dad's name was John. He had a son named John, my, brother, my mom's older brother. John had a son named John. We call him Jack. And Jack's son is named John. Okay. Um, the only male name which is probably more meh than John is Joe. The ancient Romans only had 15 first names, basically, for boys. They had zero first names for girls. If my name is Gaius Julius Caesar, all of my daughters are named Julia. Um, I could have a son named Lucius Julius Caesar. I could have a son named Tiberius, but basically there's 10 names. 18 names, 15, 12 to 15, which are used with any um, frequency. So literally, if you walked into down a Roman street and yelled, Eke Lucius, hey, Lucius, you would have like about 75 guys running at you asking you, you know, what's up, John? <laughs> so no, that would be kind of cool. But no, we can't do that. Okay, in our next exciting class, we get to meet the man, the legend, Dante Alighieri, who is going to go on his catabasis with his guide, like a Virgil. He's going down for the very first time. He's like a Virgil with his, yeah, yeah, it's time to go. I think the drugs are, okay, thank you very much. Bye, kids. <laughs>